is a grim fact. One in four women suffer domestic abuse and lockdown made that far worse, with charities reporting that calls to their helplines went up by more than 50%. Well, someone who's had long-time first-hand experience of dealing with domestic abuse cases, one of the country's most successful barristers, Sheree Blair, who joins us now from central London. Well, good morning, Mrs Blair. How are you? I am very well. How are you, Piers? Making your debut, I think, on Good yes. Morning Britain. So thank you very much. Very good to see Lovely you. Lovely to see you. Well, thank you for being so interested in this very important topic. Well, it is serious, and it's mm. been a serious issue in lockdown. We saw some very grim stories coming out of it as it was going on. You've been involved in the front line of domestic abuse cases for, for many years. How bad has it been uh, in this country through lockdown? Did it bring out the very worst in abusers? Well, first of all, I think we have to realise that people in, in abusive relationships actually have been locked down well before this lockdown and are continue to be locked down when eventually we do release from it. Because day after day, the abusive relationship essentially controls and prevents them from doing what they want to do. But there's no doubt at all, of course, that for most people before lockdown, there were avenues of escape. You could go out to work. You could take the children to school. Um, you could go whilst your abuser was at work and, and visit friends, maybe talk to them. You could go and access services that were available. Suddenly, you're trapped 24 hours a day, seven days a week, with someone who's already abusing you, who, um, and, you, well, the consequences are obvious. Well, we, and we saw, I mean, I remember very early on in lockdown, we saw some terrible headlines, which really were just sort of the public face of domestic violence and underneath those headlines there would have been many, many other stories. And of course it isn't just women who suffer domestic abuse, men do as well. I can only imagine how terrifying it would have been on the day that Boris Johnson announced that we were going into lockdown, knowing that you didn't have those avenues of escape for children as well as the partners of abusers. Do you think that the government was too slow to recognise that effectively it was imprisoning some people? Well, I think that, uh, what to be fair on the government, they did announce some additional funding for uh, the helplines uh, and for services that were being provided to, to the survivors of domestic abuse. Uh, the problem really wasn't so much the temporary money that they gave then, the problem was over these last uh, 10 years or so of austerity, the slow, gradual decline in the services, in the money available for refuges, for the uh, other services that are outside providing people with a place to escape to, but support services that can go on within the community for the helpline. All this has been affected by austerity, including, of course, cuts in benefits, because one of the ways refugees fund themselves is by using the benefit money, the, the people pay for the places in the refuge by using the benefit money. And the benefit cuts and the impact of universal credit all have had a combined impact. Well, and of on... course, you know, we, we got beyond austerity to a certain extent, didn't we? And we, now we have other economic so, consequences. Susan. Well, I know, but, you know, the, the, that was a period of time. And as you say, it's had very significant uh, effects. What I'm saying is that now we are in a position where charities, refugees have found it hard to raise money. Um, exactly. And we are now facing other economic consequences as a result of all the money that has been spent and will need to, at some stage, be paid back. I mean, the, the future, presumably, for some of... You know, I mean, you're a patron of refuge. The future is presumably bleak for a number of these places. Well, I think we have to also say... Uh, because we don't want to be too gloomy about this, that there are ways of making the future better. And part of those ways are re reflected, if you like, in the bill that is about to go into the House of Lords for its final um, legislative stages before passing into law. Uh, and one of the positive things about the bill, for example, is that firstly, it recognises uh, the wider question of domestic violence. It's not just about a physical punch. 
It's also about emotional abuse, psychological abuse, and also for the first time recognizes the huge impact this has on children. Mm -hmm. And we actually need to remember that children also need specialist services so that they can live out, uh, work out the consequences and, and come out from experience where they've seen, usually their mother, violently treated. Uh, the impact that that has on them has a long-term effect. And we need to make sure that those children are also thought about in relation to when we're talking about domestic abuse. What, what are the key changes to the law that you would like the government to effect? Well, first of all, the government has already done this. Now, of course, you appreciate that this bill should have been passed years ago, uh, but it's been impacted by all the turbulence we've had in our political life over the last couple of years. But it's now coming to its final stages. And what has been great has been the cooperative effect of all the people. I'm a patron of Refuge. There are many. Uh, actually, I'm a patron of a few other domestic violence charities as well. There are many of them, big and small across the country, came together to shape this bill in order to achieve the aims of getting better services uh, for women. And the great thing is there is now a duty on, or there will be a duty on every local authority to provide refuges. Now, <laughs> you may think there's a refuge in every town. There is not. Mm. And in fact, there have been plenty of shrinking of places. Last year, for example, refuge had to turn away over 60% of the people who wanted to use their services, their refuges, because they didn't have any spaces. So that's great. However, there's no point putting a duty on local authorities if there isn't the money to go with them. And we estimate £174 million will be needed to expand the bed space that is needed. And if that money isn't available, then the duty is just fine words. Yeah, totally agree with you. Before we let you go, uh, Mrs Blair, lockdown's been so weird Mm. for all of us in many different ways. You've had to spend it with one of the most famous people <laughs> in the world, Tony, and you did hint that his domestic chore duties were limited at best to making an omelette. Did he step up at all in lockdown? I can assure you... Let me tell you a little secret, Piers. He's probably as good as you are at domestic <laughs> duties. That is um, completely true. But I will tell you this, he's taken to reading cookery books. Really? Oh, does he, does he do anything as a result of reading them? <laughs> no, at the moment he's just saying, I like the sound of that, but he is expressing an interest in possibly doing a bit of cooking. This is a uh, massive step forward, yeah. isn't it? Any particular it cookery Perfect. writer? Any particular chef he prefers? He just likes the pretty pictures, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Cherie Blair, thank you very much indeed for joining us. We appreciate it. Yeah. It's my pleasure.